Welcome back to Good Moms, Bad Choices. I'm Erica. And I'm Mila. And happy Wednesday. Happy hump day, my love. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I was tired, but I'm happy. And, you know, podcasting brings me joy. I just realized that the music is on. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to turn it off. It's smooth jazz? Yeah. Every time I listen to smooth jazz, I feel like it's such a fucking adult. <laughs> I'm like, I it's am not, a fucking adult. It's not smooth jazz. It's lo-fi cafe. It's smooth jazz. It's That's smooth jazz for our generation. <laughs> it's low. Every time I'm in my house cleaning, I'm like, oh my God, I'm such an adult listening to smooth jazz. <laughs> it does feel very mature. Doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I've been actually, you know, this week I am feeling very mature. Feeling very like adult like, like we have. Is that why you're wearing those glasses? Yeah. See, like you like these glasses. This is my adult look. Um, to we had a call with our bookkeeper. Yeah. We have a bookkeeper. My accountant. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to call you back. I have a call with my accountant. We filed our taxes on time. Someone filed them for us. That's the only reason they're on time. We have someone who went through all of our finances and told us that we're doing good. We're bitch. We're doing a good job. Bitch. We're doing a good job. This is the most adult I've felt in my whole 33 years of existence. I ha- I've been like having to pinch myself and tell myself, "You're an adult. You're doing it. You're doing a good job. You're mom." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like every time I forget. I'm like I can't believe it. I was just a teenager yesterday. I know, me too. Um, so yeah, I'm feeling I'm stepping into my adult bag this week. I'm we're going to New York this week. I'm bringing my kid, and I'm gonna do a mature mom things and business things. I'm bringing my my kid on the work trip. We're going to meetings. <laughs> Erica today was like, I wish we just had more meetings to go to. I'm like, <laughs> who are we meeting with? You're like, I don't know. Like meetings in New York. I was like, well, make them happen. Make the meetings happen. <laughs> No wonder you're feeling adult like. That's why, because you want to have meetings. Fine. We're gonna get those meetings, but I know I'm gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> the last thing we do with those glasses, we're, we're gonna like, guess what? We got a meeting. <laughs> Can't wait. She's like, yeah, maybe MTV. <laughs> this is literally what she said. I'm like, do you know someone over there? No, no, <laughs> no. Nope, nope. I'm just gonna put it out there. MTV, we're coming for our meeting. I don't know what for what, but we're gonna be there. <laughs> Let's you know show what? Up. I think I've been watching Kanye West's uh, documentary, and it's been throwing me back to like. The MTV early 2000s yeah because he was like breaking news MTV remember breaking news MTV uh, yeah TRL or whatever it was like had like the like those like lights and it was like the solar system and then it's like oh yeah the thing behind the person and it's oh, like yeah. Kanye West producer just got in a car accident and I was like oh my god I remember that wow oh my god I didn't, I didn't watch it just for that just for the fucking it's just a throwback it back. it's yeah. a throwback it makes me feel old actually I'm like whoa was this that long ago it, it doesn't feel like it but it was the wire was a while ago when he was like normal and cool and made regular music and it wasn't fucking stressful I fucking love him I do love him I just prefer his music from before before black skinhead when I was like I still like his music I don't like his opinions all the time but I still like his music I like some of it I think he's just ridiculous but I love him my baby daddy <laughs> has made me like grow to not like Kanye because he just loves him so much. It was overkill for so many years of my life that I, it's, it's, it's not you, Kanye. It's my baby daddy. <laughs> it did make me sad for him though. Cause he was, he was, he was so like, oh, he really needs his mom. We all need our moms. No, he, he specifically really needs Donda. You oh. called me, you text me that. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Erica texts me out of nowhere. Kanye needs Donda. I was like, who, what the fuck are you talking about? He does. Watch it. I'm telling you, if you watch it, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. All right, about. I'm going to watch it. I you know what I was just thinking. Um, someone was like, yeah, his friend was just like following him with a camera forever. And I was like, I, I, our vlog is going to make it to the, our true Hollywood e-story. One day someone will see these vlogs. <laughs> One day someone's going to see all these videos on my phone. I swear to God. <laughs> Kanye did it. We could do it too. These videos are going to get publicated one day. Yeah. But anyway. Um, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, we have a special guest, you guys. If you might have heard her giggling in the background, <laughs> was I not supposed to get? Okay, no, 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 no. It's fine. We just, I can't believe you let us. I can't believe you let us rant for that long like, <laughs> about nothing. <laughs> um, we have a special guest. We have Evian Whitney here, a sexuality doula, sex educator, author. Um, I've been like following you for a very long time. Oh yeah, so strange, it's kind of creepy, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So Thank I you. know you. You don't so know that I've, I know you, but I do. Uh, <laughs> I've been like watching your whole journey. Um, <laughs> Wait, how long have you been following me? Do you know? Um, probably like six years. Oh dang! So yeah. you've been through the I'm journey. A, oh, I'm an OG. Okay, okay. She did put me on. She's like, "Do you know this woman?" And I was like, "No, but I like her. I'm going to stay here." <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, maybe it wasn't like six. Maybe it was like right around we started our podcast. Oh I yeah, because okay, was, yeah, you were doing like some workshops downtown or something. Oh yeah, we tried to link up with you. It was like a vagina workshop. I was like, I want to go to that vagina it was workshop. Sold out because you're booked and busy. And oh I'm, yeah, and I was like, are they actually uh-huh. talking to the vaginas in a circle with each other? I had a lot of questions. Now it's all coming back to me. <laughs> I was like, were the women pantyless? I need to know. I need. I wanted to go just to see what was going on over there. Were they? <laughs> No. Okay. Yeah. I figured that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bitches get weird when everyone's pussy is out. <laughs> I mean, I would love to do a workshop like that sometime. But I'm sure those workshops exist. I'll come. Oh, yeah. I volunteer. Yeah. I'll definitely come to okay. that. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> um, well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, so this month's theme is mindfulness. And I feel like, I mean, before we get into it, I, I just want to say what the theme is. It's mindfulness. Hello. Hi, guys. You guys have been listening. You know, it's mindfulness. I feel like you're the perfect guest for this because you talk so much about, um, you know, your sensuality and like, you know, I in your journey, I've watched you really choose yourself a lot. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that that's so powerful and such a journey and difficult for women oftentimes um i have a lot of questions i'm so inquisitive okay. like i've been waiting for you to get here for a long time hey well i'm, <laughs> I'm so happy you're here i'm excited to bring on the questions well i first do you want to start with do you have an affirmation for our guests today yeah I mean, for our audience? I mean the first the first thing that popped into my mind is i'm at peace with my sexuality Mm, I am yeah. at peace with my sexuality. I like that. Yeah, that's something that I've said to myself throughout my journey. So I want to offer it to other people. I love that. Do you? F- I mean, obviously you've you've had it. Do you feel like you've that's changed a lot throughout this period? Like you've gone from this to this. Like your sexuality journey, I'm sure, has evolved as you've evolved. I've, I've we've been doing some some reading and research on you, but can you tell our listeners how you started in this space and like what this journey has been and how you've come about? Because I don't think women have really given themselves the opportunity to explore their sensuality and sexuality, and you really have. So, like, how did this yeah. begin? Yeah, um, I got started as a sex educator from a place of just like wanting to figure my sexuality out. Like, I wasn't thinking to myself, I'm going to be a sex educator. It was more like, why am I not having amazing sex? Why does sex still trigger me? And why do I still have sexual shame, even though I'm in a loving relationship and there's really no reason for me to be experiencing those things? Um, And at the time, this was like 11 years ago, there wasn't really a lot of information out there that really resonated with me. It was more like, if you have sexual shame, just fuck some more. And like... (laughs) that'll teach your body to not have sexual shame anymore by doing the opposite. And maybe for some people that works. Um, It did not work for me. And I felt really frustrated that there weren't different approaches of like really getting down to the bottom of where that sexual shame comes from, what that sexual trauma could be, how to heal from that. And so I started um, just like working on myself and figuring it out, like carving out my own path to sexual healing. And um, I was doing it very publicly. I had a blog at the time where I was talking very publicly about all the things that I was trying and struggling with and just being very honest about my journey. Um, And people took notice. They were reading and were like, holy shit, you are speaking my story, which I didn't think so. I thought I was literally the only one that was having these sexual issues. Um, And yeah, from there, I just... I. One thing that I say about this work is that I feel like it chose me that I didn't choose it Mm -hmm. because... I was just doing my thing, trying to figure my shit out. And I think um, other people found such a resonance with my story and really trusted that I could guide them into their own sexual liberation journeys because they were watching me do the very same alongside them. So, um, yeah, I've been doing this work uh, in so many ways since 2011. So, yeah. It's beautiful. I think think a lot of women don't even recognize, like, did you come – is your family religious? Did you grow up in like a religious background? Yes. So I grew up in purity culture. I couldn't really tell you the sort of denomination of Christianity we were. I would say we're like, it's a mix of like evangelical, Baptist, and Protestant. Mm-hmm. But I signed a purity contract when I was eight. So like that kind of gives you, yeah. What so, is a purity contract for wow. those that don't know? Okay. So a purity contract. I don't know. I don't, I'm, the, I'm them. Okay. So um, <laughs> I wonder if people still do these because um, back in the day they were all the rage. But a purity contract is a contract that you sign um, in your church that basically says you will not have sex until you are married. And your parents co-sign it, your pastor, 
you know, youth teacher, whatever, signs it. And um, yeah, that's what a period At eight? Mm -hmm. Do they even explain what sex is before that? No. They're just like, you're going to be pure. And then you yeah. say, okay. I mean, I think at the time I had sort of a faint idea of what sex was, but not really. I was like, okay, everyone else is doing this. And apparently this is what I need to do in order for Jesus to love me and my parents to love me. So I'll do it. So that's so interesting. Yeah. My daughter, our daughters are seven and like eight is approaching anytime, like very soon. And to think about like our daughters at this age signing a contract about their bodies, so, about their sexual it's bodies. Weird, it's right? really weird, right? It's really weird. It makes me wonder who thought of this concept. Probably you, a man. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm like, why are you even thinking of that? Yeah, like, probably why, a man. And who birthed this? And then who was like, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, by the way, that contract did not stick. Uh, I, I had sex for the first time when I was 15. But um, the roots of that, like the oppression of that has, you know, stuck with me because how could it not, you know? When you finally did have sex, <clears throat> not finally, when you had sex... <laughs> When you, when you finally, I mean, finally is did, fine. When you, sure. When you did have sex, did you feel guilt because of the contract that you had signed? Oh, fuck yeah. I mean, so this is, it's such a complicated story. The first time that I had sex was actually the first time that I had sex with someone who I now know to be a, an abuser mm. for me. So on the one hand, there was a lot of choice because I was like, I am 15. I am grown. I know my shit. This is what I want to do. We're going to get married someday. Like it was kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm. But then there was this other aspect of me of like, I think there was some coercion involved. And I also, because I didn't receive comprehensive sex education, it was more like abstinence only, do not have sex. Um, I didn't understand or wasn't taught about what a healthy sexual relationship looks like. So for me, ha hearing all these messages, you know, in my church and from my parents about sex is love, sex is love, sex is for marriage. I thought that if you are in love with someone, you have, you have sex, sex with them oh. and that's it. Like there wasn't anything in there about consent or bodily autonomy or the pleasure of sex. It was just like sex is love, sex is for marriage, et cetera. So when I had sex, I thought I was coming from it from an informed place. But looking back now, I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. And that relationship was both liberating in the sense that I chose sort of to have sex, but also it was a violation because the power dynamic within that relationship was just not healthy. So it's com it's very complicated. I mean, I, I think it's that's a very important topic to touch on. Like as we're talking about kids and adolescents and sex and choice, um, I think that there isn't enough emphasis on for young women. Like I think we have this very rigid idea of like rape, you know. And even yes. for us, it feels like. You be, if you use that word, it better be violent. Yep. It better be a stranger be, and, jumping out of the, the bushes. Bush. Yep. And and exactly. you and you better not use it lightly. Yep. And, and the reality of the matter is, is like we've like we're women. First of all, we've been violated, and like a lot. Even like hearing you discuss this is th me thinking of my childhood and my sexuality and like just fucking because that's what people were doing and like I thought you're, that's what you're supposed to do and I wanted to but like the cohesion like the cohe cohesion coercion coercion mm -hmm. um, that takes place and you're not even acknowledging it as such is such like so much to dig yourself out of in adulthood I've, I, I've been violated so many times yeah. in my life and just massage to do things I didn't want to do and it's very rapey and like yeah. I was for a long time I would never say those words because it felt too intense you mm -hmm. know like I wouldn't put that on that person because then they're a rapist but like yeah we need to call a spade a spade mm -hmm. and like those are the conversations we should be having with our kids early yeah because that shit is real mm -hmm. yeah I um I really resonate with that it wasn't until I was I think I was 19 18 or 19 when Funnily enough, I was talking to a guy that I was seeing at the time and I was talking to him about my previous relationship that was just abusive and 
but I didn't think so. I was just like, that's what everyone does. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to him a little bit about um, some of the things that I was experiencing. And he was actually the one that was like, uh, what you just described is rape. And I was like, no, it wasn't because I said yes. And he's like, no, that sounds like rape. And that sent me spiraling because I was like, oh, shit, this whole time I thought that this was a loving relationship. We were together for three years. Um I thought that he loved me and I loved him. What the fuck does that mean? But yeah, I agree with you. I think we need to expand our understandings of what sexual trauma and sexual violation can look like because I think a lot of folks are walking around traumatized within their sexualities and they don't even know it because they've been like, oh no, that was normal sexual behavior. But it's like, no, that that person was actually violating your boundaries and um, your autonomy, you know? And I think it, like when that happens in women, first of all, like even if you don't grow up in, in a very religious background or you didn't have to sign a purity contract, <laughs> there's still a, like a lot of confusion about our bodies and what we're supposed to do or what, what's acceptable. And like there's a lot of mixed messaging for young girls and like it's confusing. You don't and it's hard to to weed out your own thoughts about things versus what your friends are telling you in high school and shit, what you think you're supposed to do. You think you're in love. You think you're going to get married to this person. You're not going to see after fucking 12th grade but like especially now i think even too with like social media like it's just so everything is so hyper sexualized too that you get so confused about what you're where you're supposed to be at at your age Mm -hmm. you know and there is so much shame i mean even thinking about I, i always think about like my period like when i first started my period and how they're really it was just like now you can get pregnant and i was like what the fuck like we haven't even talked about sex yet what you mean? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I can get pregnant. Like, you know, and I, I'm curious to know, like, after, so h- how, now that you're in the space, your relationship with your parents, so, like, do they accept, like, what you do? Do they understand what you do? Um, have you had these conversations about your past with them now? I have. So I don't really have a relationship with my dad. Um, that is by choice. My mom, and what I will say about my dad before I get into the relationship with my mom, my mom at first was very much against what I was doing. Both my parents actually were. Are they still married? No. Okay. My parents separated and divorced like 15 years ago. Um, and yeah, so my dad, he, he believes that what I am doing is absolute like sinful. Like I am leading people astray down into the pits of hell. Like that's how he views the work that I do. Um, which is really unfortunate because, you know, that's, I mean, I don't know. I was about to say that's not what I'm doing, but it's like, well, if I am leading people to hell, like join the party. (laughs) Um, my mom, on the other hand, my mom was very much along those lines. She was like, I don't like this. Both of my parents are very Christian. My mom is married to a pastor right now. So, um, she was just like, you know, the sex is not something you talk about. It's something that's private. And, um, Funnily enough, the more that I've gotten into this work, I I actually interviewed her on my podcast Mm. a few years ago, and that was really interesting. I wanted to interview her because I was really interested to know what she grew up thinking sex was, like what her parents taught her, what her sexual relationship was like when she met my dad and she was a teenager and all those things. Mm -hmm. And so this conversation was meant to just be very like chill and light and it was funny and it was chill light and funny um but she dropped some gems in that episode and i mean i'm happy to share them here because it's public but like basically she uh, alluded insinuated that her first time of having sex was a rape Mm. and i didn't know that Mm. um another thing that she told me which was, you know, um, <laughs> when I first had sex, I was fucking really, really negligently because like no one told me it's important to use a condom. I had a pregnancy scare when I was like 16 and I told my mom cause I was freaking out. I was late for like, I think two and a half weeks. And, um, I was like, please don't tell my dad, please don't tell my dad. Like I promise I'll never have sex again. <laughs> Um, and somehow she did. She told my dad, <clears throat> my dad was so furious with me. Um, he didn't speak to me for two weeks mm. because I think he felt that I was just a dirty, impure human being. And I remember one of the things he said to me was like, I can't believe you didn't wait. Your mother waited. And that always stuck with me 
There was, there was like that, that was sort of like the lore in our family. Like your mother was a virgin. I was not, my father was not like he had a, he had a Rolodex of all the women that he had had slept with. Like, seriously, we saw it. Like Mm. he, he showed us photos and everything. It was like, it was weird. (laughs) How, how, how does he justify, how how does he justify saying that to you? And also, also these are my women before your mother. I don't know Mm. the cognitive dissonance of it all. Mm. Um, so so that was sort of the story. Like your mother, like I was such a bad boy, but your mom, she was so pure and she was so sweet and she waited until we were married. So when we're having this conversation on my podcast, she basically dropped and said that, no, she wasn't a, a virgin when she got married. Uh. And that like, I mean, you can even hear it in, in the episode. I was like, wait, what? So you've been just going along with this lie yeah, all like, this time? Y'all been shaming me for having sex when you did the very same thing? The fuck? I was so mad. <laughs> but also, I just felt really honored that my mom would feel comfortable to share that with me, even though it took a long time. And like, I had a lot of trauma around, around that. that. Yeah, I was really happy that she she told me that story. And since then, mm-hmm. she was like, when am I going to come on your podcast? I want to talk about sex more. Oh, so, okay, really? mom. Yeah, so she's actually been on my podcast, <laughs> um, I think two more times or one more time after that. We played like a 21 questions where I asked like all these goofy questions, like what was the funniest time that you had sex or whatever so my mom is she's come around a lot and I think she really realizes that the work that I do isn't gratuitous I think I think in the beginning she thought that I was just sharing about my sex life as a way to share about my sex life attention yeah and so now she sees and I think because like I have a podcast and I'm an author now and like I've been doing this for a long time I'm speaking in colleges I think the respectability of it all she's like oh okay what you're doing is is good it's not just pornographic which for her I think that's what she thought I was doing yeah but yeah my parents took a long time my dad is still very much like when I Google you, it's very disappointing. And I'm like, why are you Googling me? But like the things that come up around me when you like, it's, it's good stuff. It's not. And even if it wasn't, who cares? Right. I'm, I'm a still your child. Adult. Right. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's so <clears throat> as a, as a mom, I think that that's, it's really beautiful to see that, that she's been able to kind of give you that. I mean, yeah. I, I th- it sounds like over time she'll, be more and more open and that she really does want to have those conversations with you and then maybe she was I mean I don't know your daddy and I don't want to judge him but like sound like maybe she was a little held captive (laughs) yeah no and that's that's a fair that's a fair thing to say like just saying like she was held captive to this idea that she had to portray this image that he bestowed upon her Mm -hmm. essentially that you were this good girl and you were this and you were that and you were a virgin and she was just like Okay. Right. That's what. Yeah. I am. My mom was raised in like a Kojic church, so like they weren't Kojic? allowed Kojic uh, Church of uh, Church of God in Christ. I think is what it's basically. <laughs> it's like a, um, and people are going to like bash me for this because I don't one hundred percent know. I just know that it's like um, something that's really popular amongst Black folks in the Black community. Um, it's a very strict. Uh, Baptist-ish type of denomination. Mm. Like, she wasn't allowed to dance. Like mm. she, what? Yeah, like, she wasn't allowed to wear dresses that were, like, above the knee. So she she was raised in a very, very strict home, and I think I think that is why I kind of got that those teachings, even though I don't feel like my mom at the time was when she was raising me was really in the Kojic church. But I think, you know, that's what her mom taught her about sex and bodies. And and that was actually something that came through in the podcast episode, because I for a long time held so much resentment of my mom to be like, why? Like, you knew this and you saw me struggling. Like, why didn't you speak up and say, I've been there and right. like, you're not alone and it's okay. And like, don't be out here fucking reckless, like mm. use condoms or whatever. Like you could have used that opportunity. And I realized that, um, she just didn't know how because she didn't see anyone else model that for right. her. So, and, and yeah. what a beautiful, like that her daughter is kind of leading that way for her. Yeah. I feel like in a lot of ways I've, I've helped to sexually liberate my mom, whether she would admit that or not. I think that I have. And Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Because I think, uh, I think for a lot of us, 
it's important that we ask those questions. What was your relationship with sex in your childhood? What mm-hmm. conversations did your mom have with you? Because nine times out of 10, there weren't many. And that yeah. we, I think that's our whole thing too, is like uh, sometimes we adopt ideas without really choosing them. We just are inheriting the, exactly. and the ideas and then putting them on our kids and perpetuating that same cycle without questioning it. And I right. think like that's the most important, you know, right now it's like, even for us, people, you know, could scroll past our shit and be like, oh, these these moms are talking about sex and smoking weed and, and make and make assumptions. But it's more it's like I, I, I encourage everyone to dig deeper into our relationship, like your relationship with certain things and the why, you know, like yeah. there's not a lot. Most of the time you didn't choose that, you know, and like yep. it's really important as we raise girls in this time that they're that we're not doing the same thing our parents did to us because yeah. like my mom found birth control in my bed and I was like all hell broke loose and I and, and I got I did get yeah. pregnant in high school and the school called and said I wasn't there and it was fucking traumatic and my dad didn't talk to me for like two and a half weeks in the house and I was just like I'm a horrible little slut <laughs> you know and it's yeah. just like how how much of that did I hold on to and then like I feel like some people have shame sexually sh- sexual shame or sexual trauma and they disassociate during sex mm-hmm. and they like completely stay away from it or they become hypersexual or both because I did both I was hypersexual yeah. and disassociating during sex and then like knowing something was wrong but not really and feeling like oh I'm liberated you know like I can do whatever I want so mm-hmm. I'm fucking but in reality I was being co- coerced by like older men and just things that I really probably wouldn't have chosen had I been more clear about what it is I actually wanted. And if I was actually having sex for my pleasure and taught that that was a priority and that was even important. So I just think it's like kudos to you for healing that part of your, like the women in your family and like, in yeah, the future man. Too. I think about my ancestors a lot with this work. Like I can't help but think about my grandmothers and their mothers and the things that they learned about their bodies. Also the ancestors that I had that did not have bodily autonomy and could not choose to um, have sex in a pleasurable way, you know? So a lot of this work for me is about honoring them and also bringing healing to, to the folks that came before me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know like a part of your journey, you discuss like just sexual abuse that you've, that you've experienced. And like I said, as women, I feel like most of all women have been violated yeah. to be a woman is rape. Yeah. This is my, this is my number one quote. Um, and I know you've used like your work to heal that. And I, <clears throat> I think how, in what ways have you used sensuality to heal trauma? Because I think for some people, when something happens to them and th- that is taken away from them, they completely disassociate with sensuality, with sexuality, and they're like, I'm good. Yeah. Instead of, but you've used it as a tool. And like, in what ways has that helped you? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, when I first got started with my journey of um, sexual healing, I was kind of having those same experiences that you were naming, like, being like, okay, I'm an adult now. I get to have all the sex that I want and I get to be free, but it wasn't connected to anything. Like I wasn't connected to my body. I wasn't even connected to actual pleasure or my real desires. I was almost like going through the motions of what folks told me that my sex life should look like. Um, And I think honestly that did a lot more damage because I was overriding my body. Like my body was being like, slow down. We don't want to have sex. Like it's it's triggering for, for us. And I'm like, but I'm a fucking adult. Like- I'm with my husband. Let's fucking do that. Like it's, that's not healthy, you know? Um, And so I actually kind of took a step back from sex and started to focus only on sensuality, which I know a lot of people tend to mix those things. They use those words interchangeably, but sensuality is very different from sexuality. Um, It has its own meaning and its own experience. And sensuality for me means just being in your body and being of the body. Um, And especially feeling into your body and and the pleasure that it can experience both inside and outside of the bedroom. So sensuality for me was a lot more accessible because I'm like, okay, sex, I can put that on the back burner, but can I be in my own body? Like, what is it like for me to really inhabit my body? What is it like for me to listen to the messages of my body? And I think that's what sexual trauma steals from us. It steals 
from us our ability to connect to our body because we've been taught through that trauma that our bodies aren't safe to inhabit. Um, I also think that sexual trauma takes away our ability to trust the voice of our body. Mm. Uh, So sensuality for me has been a really important piece in connecting back to my sexual self because, I mean, it all starts with the body, you know? Like we're not having sex with anything else. We're having sex with our bodies. And a lot of us are having sex thinking that we're totally present, but we're not. Like we're all the way up here or we're like in another room or, you know, we're doing something in our heads, math or thinking about you know, uh, shopping lists or whatever. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think that we need to be more aware of the things that take us out of our bodies and also pay attention when our bodies are like, yeah, we're not here. Maybe that means we should slow down or stop or try something different. Like, what does that look like? You know? Mm-hmm. And, and then even when you do get those signals and, and you know that then speaking on it, cause that's mm-hmm. a whole different thing. Feeling empowered enough to be like, actually, I don't want to do this. It, this is so layered. And like, I, I just feel it on my spirit to say like, this is really, really hard to do. Like, it's very easy for me to talk about it. Like, Oh yeah, just listen to your body. And <laughs> if your body says stop. Then, but like, if you don't have a connection to your body at all, and if you've been taught that your voice doesn't matter, that whether you you say no or yes, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen to you anyway. Um, if you have been raised in a culture, like I think a lot of us have, that makes sex appear to be so serious and also so, um, what is the word? superficial at the same time like there's a lot of confusing messages so like I just want to pause and say like this takes fucking work and it takes years to get to this this space um but it really just starts by like creating practices that where you can listen to your body maybe not in the sexual realm like that might be a little bit too much um maybe that looks like creating practices where you are paying attention to your body during the day you know or you're carving out time where You are exploring what pleasure or feeling good in your body feels like outside of sex. Um, I think a lot of us only designate pleasure in the bedroom. Like we allow ourselves to feel like, oh, this is where I'm allowed to experience pleasure, ask for what I want or whatever. Um, But we are allowed to explore and express our pleasure in a platonic way as well. So beginning that um, relationship, I think, is really important. Those are like really good first steps to getting to that point where you can, in the middle of sex, be like, Ah, uh, yeah, my I'm paying attention to my body. My heart's racing a little bit. I now understand like what it feels like when I'm dissociating. I am not in my body. Let's let's pause and slow down. Like it's taken me <clears throat> ten fucking years. To I get was to gonna that say space. that in itself is very very difficult for mm-hmm. for women, mm-hmm. me included, to especially once you've agreed that okay, we're having sex. Like we're gonna do this. We're doing it. I'm into it. To then stop the process and say, you know what? Mm, body's saying something else yeah. like that there's as women we have so much we have a lot of um we resist saying no or stepping away because we feel like we've already agreed to something mm-hmm. obligated <clears throat> and it's like oh well th- he's gonna think i'm crazy or he's gonna think i'm overly emotional mm-hmm. or he's gonna think like there's something wrong with me like right. or there's something wrong with him i don't want to make him feel bad mm-hmm. you know i that i would say that i don't know like the all the steps, but I feel like that's like step 10 because like, yeah, I feel like that is a really, really difficult for women. Me, like I said, me included. I mean, I think, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it is difficult. I want to affirm that it's really fucking hard. It's especially hard when you're in a relationship with someone who, if you were to say no and be like, Hey, I know that we were just like getting it on and I'm, but let's stop. Like, and that person would be like, uh, the fuck like that makes it difficult too, you know, so I think it starts first and foremost by like picking a partner that understands the nuances of your sexuality and like the ways that your um it's not even about like your sexuality, but can see like your humanity. Like it's okay for you to stop if you don't want to do something. It's mm-hmm. okay for the consent to change. Like if you said yes and now it's a no, that's okay. And hopefully you'll pick partners that are just like, I'll go with the flow. We can do something else. We can find different ways to be intimate. This We'll put a pin in this and get to it tomorrow or whatever. Um, a lot of people, a lot of men aren't 
capable of doing that, you know? So it's important to pick partners that are able to give you grace and space as you are on this sexual healing journey so that when you have these moments where you need to pause or when you're getting triggered or something like that, that they can be able to hold you in that, not judge you or blame you for that and also like take care of you, you know? I know that you've been married for 14 years and it sounds like you picked a great, a, a great excellent partner. Yep. Don't know how I did that. <laughs> I was going to say, like, did you know like ahead of time that he was going to be? <laughs> it was so crazy. We met on MySpace. And- wow. <laughs> yeah. It was, so bad. Yeah. It was supposed to be like a one night stand. I was like, I'm out of this relationship. I'm just going to have a fuck buddy. And that did not work. We like were saying we loved each other within eight days of, of meeting each other. And yeah, he's, he's been, he's been wonderful. Um, especially as I, like my parents went through a really traumatic divorce and it, it really shaped the way that I thought about marriage and <clears throat> men in particular. Um, and I kind of, thought at the time that like I'm never gonna get married like fuck men men are trash yuck (laughs) um and yeah we just divine alignment we met my person so I mean I I I would imagine that like this journey and especially like you mentioned like having a partner where you're exploring your sensuality and listen listening to your body and possibly stopping during sex I mean even like I said I've been you know following you for a while and I know that you guys are married, but then chose to live separate from one another and like kind of figure out who you guys are as individuals outside of, you know, co coexisting in one space together. Mm. How did that conversation go? (laughs) Because I feel like, you know, we we were talking about, we had, um, we had, uh, this woman on her name's Erin Claire Jones and she's a human design expert. Mm. And she was discussing how certain designs like are that were really meant to, you know, live in separate, like have separate rooms, have separate spaces. Like it's really healthy for people to ex- exist and have their own spaces. This is even more, you know, this is even deeper than that. This is yeah. actually like, I love you, but I'm actually going to move out. Mm-hmm. And I still want to be married to you, but I'm actually going to go do yeah. my own thing for a while. Mm-hmm. That was, that was, that was, very interesting. Um, and how did you, I, I think that's a two part question. How yeah. did you arrive to that? And then how did that conversation go? Yeah, I mean, that was really tricky and complex. I, I was actually visiting LA and I'm from this area originally. I was previously living in Portland, Oregon, hated almost every second of it. I just did not resonate with the, <clears throat> the land or the people or the culture there. And I was visiting LA for the first time since I moved to Portland and I felt such a like, like I just felt it in my heart, like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be here. Like this is home. Like this is what home is supposed to feel like. And so I, um, during that trip, I was just like, fuck, what would it be like if I like moved to LA? And it was so weird. I started looking at apartments, but I wasn't thinking about like, oh, Jonathan's going to come with me and my dog. It was like, it would be so cute if I got a studio. And I'm like, whoa, where is this coming from? And, um, then I visited California again and I felt that feeling even more so of just like, you need to be here. You need to get the fuck out of Portland. It's not good for you. And uh, my partner was not really interested in moving to L.A. I I wouldn't say that he was like in love with Portland, but he was definitely not wanting to move back to to California. So I just sort of broached the subject of like, what would it look like? First, I said, what would it look like if like I spent three months in L.A.? You know, like maybe I would visit you, but, you know, I'm, I'm here all the time for work. It makes sense. Like, you know, maybe we could save a little bit of money if I'm like spend like stretches of time there on airfare or whatever. And he was like, yeah, that's kind of a cool idea. Sure, we could do that. And then I started getting like really, really clear messages that like you are supposed to move here and you are supposed to move here without your partner. Like that's what you're supposed to do. And um, I remember having that conversation with Jonathan and he was like, so you're breaking up with me? And I'm like, I don't know what this means. I'm just like getting these messages and I feel like I am supposed to be apart from you. Um, and I think the the context behind this is that we got married when I was super young. Um, I was 20 when we got married. I was 19 when we, when we met and I never had the experience of living alone. Like I lived with my mom and then I mean my sister and then I met Jonathan and I moved in with him. So I did, and I didn't go to college or have the dorm experience. So I 
never had that experience of being by myself. And then also with us being together for so long, I was with him 24 seven. There wasn't a lot of time for me to find my own rhythm. Um, and I mean, our, our relationship is pretty, pretty flexible. And I, I feel like we've created a lot of space for each of us to grow individually, but there was something that was really calling to me about like, what is it like for you to be by yourself? Like, who are you outside of this relationship? Like, who are you when you're not a wife and who are you if you're just like by yourself? Um, and there are a lot of hard conversations. And like I said, you know, there's no model for this. Like any, any time that I would Google this on the internet, they'd be like, oh, so you're separating and <laughs> separation leads to divorce. I'm like, no, 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 that's not it. Cause like, I'm really happy in my relationship and there's nothing wrong. And I really want to be with you. I just want to live apart from you for a stretch of time. Uh, so we sort of figured it out kind of on our own that, um, we were going to do this thing and it was going to confuse a lot of people. Like my mom was freaking out. She's like, oh, so you guys are getting a divorce and you're just not telling me. And I'm like, no, I promise you everything's good. Um, and yeah, we, uh, he stayed in, in Oregon and I moved down to LA for a year. Um, COVID happened two weeks after. I oh moved. my God. Damn. If there so, was ever a sign. Right. Wow. Like, now sit. Yeah, that that was, I mean, first of all, the fact that COVID happened two weeks after I got here, like if I hadn't moved then, I would have gotten stuck in Portland. Right. Yeah. So sure. I was very grateful. Like seriously, my ancestors and my spirit guides were with me, like get the fuck out. So um, yeah, so we were, we lived, we lived apart for a year, about a year and um, he moved back a year ago. So now we're, we're together again. Did you guys see, like, did you guys stay apart the entire time? We had to, um, at least for the first five months because of COVID, like right. everything was shut down. So we, um, originally we had said, we're going to see each other twice a month. So I'll fly up to Oregon and then you'll fly down to LA and we'll get a chance to see each other. Um, but that didn't happen of course, because of COVID. And then like later as you know, COVID started to not surge. Um, we saw each other, I think like four times throughout that, that year. Um, but yeah, it was not at all <laughs> what we planned, not yeah. at all what we planned. And I think that was for the best because it really allowed me to sit my ass down and like literally be alone. Cause when I moved here, I was like, sweet, I'm going to be around my friends. I'm going to be doing work stuff. I'm going to be partying. And it's like, nope, no, you're not. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would think so. I would think, I mean, I know you got, you had mentioned that you guys uh, are open and you guys have your own, you, you do that separately. And obviously with COVID happening, that, I mean, dating and all those things was oh, been no. really terrible and non-existent. I, we have, <laughs> so there was really like, you really couldn't even entertain that. Like you mm -hmm. really had to, and, and, yeah. and because this was not necessarily his choice what was that like for him? Like, does he, did he, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I think whenever you choose yourself, it's never a bad choice, right? Like, that's right. But I that's think, right. and even, I mean, I don't want to say that he didn't choose himself, but you kind of helped him do that. Yeah. And made him have to kind of do that. <laughs> yeah. I sort of forced him into choosing himself. I mean, he wasn't like adamantly against it. He was concerned and I was also concerned because I didn't know what the fuck we were doing. I just was sort of being guided by, by intuition with it. But, um, in the end, when we were really starting to like pack up things and like, uh, formulate the plan of where he was going to go, he was really excited. He was like, yeah, you know, I've been with you for 13, 14 years. I kind of forgot who I am outside of this relationship. And I think that this is going to be really good for me to focus on myself as well. And so, and I, I love that about him. You know, um, he like got into therapy and was like seeing his therapist once a week and he was healing his body and creating relationships with friends and really analyzing, you know, his own um, party and being like white supremacist, patriarchal capitalist society. My partner is white. So like that, that is a really, I'm glad that we took that time because it really allowed us both to work on ourselves. And then when we came together, it was like a totally different relationship, mm. you know, like I felt, I felt like I was 100% strong in who I was, what I wanted, what I needed. And I felt that he also came to me with that. And then we just decided let's create something new from this, from this place. So it was, it was really wonderful. It was really great. 
I know that you've also talked about um, being an ace. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard that term before. Oh, really? No, I'd never heard that term before. I've learned so much in this space, honestly. And you did this reel, which I thought was really... It was it, it shed a lot of perspective on it, um, and if you guys don't know what an ace is, it's, I mean asexual. Someone who's yeah, someone who's asexual. asexual. Mm-hmm. And you were like, the, what, what, like how people view someone who says they're asexual, <laughs> and it's like you're like all frumpy and shit, yeah. and you're not like sexy, <laughs> and you look like you know. And I and then and and then you came out, and you're like you know sensual and beautiful, and mm-hmm. I think that I've never. I guess I've never met anyone that identifies as, is, isn't, is it, would you be identifying as that? Sure. Or yeah. For it's a sexual identity or a sexual orientation, I guess. Yeah. Can you explain to our listeners a little bit more about like what that means and, and how you came to, to this as well? Yeah. So, um, to be ace is to be someone who is asexual. Um, and so an asexual person is, a person that is on a spectrum of, of sexuality. Um, I think our culture has taught us that a person who is asexual means that they do not have sex. They hate having sex. They're literally sex repulsed. Um, and there are ace folks who have that experience, but there are also ace people like myself who have sex, like having sex. Um, but don't approach sex from this space that, I think culture and media has taught us that like you get horny and you have sex immediately. Like for me, I don't really get horny. Um, I mean, I, I have a desire for sex, but it doesn't look like let's rip my clothes off and go like it's, there's a nuance to my sexuality as opposed to being like, let's fucking get it on. Or like, I don't want to have sex at all. So I think that's like the most important thing that I want to stress about asexuality is for so long, people have seen it as it's an either black or white thing. And it's actually a spectrum. And a lot of people fall on that spectrum, a lot more people than I think people realize. Um, I think there was, at least when I was coming up into the sex education space, it was like only 1% of people are asexual. And I don't think that that's true. I think there's actually a lot more people, especially if you see it within that, um, within that spectrum. And um, yeah, I identify as someone who is demisexual. Y'all can look that up. Um, basically a demisexual is someone who can only have sex with people if they have an emotional connection with them. Um, so casual sex is not for me. Learn that the hard way. I tried to have a hoe phase. It did not work. (laughs) Um, and my journey to that was a little difficult because I think, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about sexual liberation is like freedom, fuck all the time. I get to fuck and have all the sex that I want. And I definitely fell underneath that pressure of like, okay, I'm grown. That means I can have all the sex that I want and I need to be having sex all the time. Um, And so this idea that I could be asexual was like, no, 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 that's like, that's, that's not liberation. In my work, I have now seen that sexual liberation is not about how much sex you have or who you have sex with or how many times you have sex in a day, but it's really about you being at peace with who you are as a sexual being, no matter where you are that day. Like if that is like, I don't want sex, I'm not even thinking about sex, my sexuality is the furthest thing from my mind, like that is sexual liberation because you are honoring who you are as a sexual being. Um, I would much rather be someone who is able to say like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not interested in sex right now, then override my body and continue this, um, this, this cycle of harming myself and violating my body, which is going to disassociate me from it. So, um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. I don't know if I answered your question. No, no, you did. (laughs) I, you know, I think that people, there's so many misconceptions around women who, um, are sex educators or are, you know, um, leading the way for women to kind of tap into their sensuality or sexuality and they assume that you just must be out here fucking you know yeah that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come out as asexual to like really smash this perception because people are always thinking that I'm having orgies all the time and I'm like (laughs) I wish I mean I've I've got shit to do man I don't have I don't have time for for orgies and stuff like that um so (laughs) yeah is it important that your partner also identify as that or is it no I mean I think I think it can be difficult. I've I've certainly know that, um, and even when I came out as ace, um, people were sort of telling their horror stories of like they came out to ace 
or came out as ace to their partner of three years and then they broke up with them. Mm. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of ace phobia out there. Like people just hear that word and they're like, oh, so you're never going to have sex with me again then? Well, peace out. It's like, bro, I've been with you for three years. We've been having sex. We've been right. having it's sex. It's the same shit. Like it's literally the same. I'm just identifying as something. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about what asexuality is. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, and also, you know, we put a lot of pressure on a relationship to have sex. Like the whole point of being in a romantic relationship is to have sex with someone, which, you know, if that's your thing, that's your thing. But there's so many different aspects to my relationship that isn't sexual. Like I'm with my partner, not because of the sex that we have, but because he's a really good person and he's one of my best friends and he is a caregiver. And also he allows me to caretake him. Like we have a dynamic that isn't solely based on the sex we have. And I feel very lucky that, you know, me coming out as ace, my partner didn't run for the hills. He was more like, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, based on how long we've been together and based on the way that you approach sex in our relationship, it would make sense that you were ace because um, I think one of one of the easiest ways that I can explain it is that my sexuality isn't easily accessible. Like it's not. And I think that's one of the things that trips people up about who I am because and I've experienced this actually when I was um, dating in our open relationship, folks would know who I was because I have a presence online and so they're like "Ooh, Evian, sex educator so we're gonna have all the sex with all the sex toys and they would get really disappointed oh my god I just had a visual of you like going up going to someone's house and yeah I'm like laying everything out and like <laughs> wanting to impress you and you being like nope nope yeah like it, it literally um a really great example it took me three weeks which may not be a lot for for folks but it took me three weeks to have sex with my partner when we first started dating and I started dating someone outside of my partner when we were in an open relationship and she was like um yeah so we've been dating for like two weeks why haven't you like had sex with me and I'm like girl I mean, that's who I am. Like, it takes me a little bit. So, like, that's that's something that I, I feel um, is really frustrating about being a sex educator or just, like, being in the space where I'm talking about sex a lot. People automatically assume that your sexuality is going to be accessible to me. Mm. And all I have to do is, like, sweet talk you, buy you some dinner, mm -hmm. tell you that you're beautiful, and your legs will open. And it's like, no, you got to work for it. Right. And, and I will make you work for it, <laughs> especially right. if I get that energy from you. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, you're are you identifying as ace or even people that are identify as ace that are, that are, like, farther on the spectrum of, like, being repulsed by sex, is it rooted in sexual trauma? I think it can be, and I think it also doesn't have to be. Um, I think I think one of the things that happens with ace folks and asexuality in general is our minds immediately go to, what happened to you to make you like that? Mm -hmm. Like, sex is natural. Everybody should have sex. So if you're not having it and you're not desiring it, that means that there's something wrong with you. I just illustrated what it means to be in a compulsory sexuality type of world, which is this belief that everybody should be sexual, like like from standard, everyone should be sexual, everyone should be horny, having all kinds of sex, and if you're not, then there's something wrong with you. And with asexuality, we are creating a different way of seeing our sex <clears throat> lives and our sexual selves as being like, we're a lot more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's not there are many different types to be sexual just as there are many different types to be human um and so i don't like to touch or it's not that i don't like to touch it it's it's more like i don't want to accentuate that like yes asexuality comes from people who have been sexually traumatized because i'm sure people could listen to my story and be like oh well, that's the reason why that you know she's ace is because you know she had sexual violation or whatever um and that could be the case maybe or not. Either way, I'm ace, and that's like, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? I think I'm ace sometimes. I can I'm, I recommend I a book? I'm, I think I'm sometimes ace. Yeah. Can I recommend a book? Are you? <laughs> I am. There are times where I'm like, I don't, I'm good. I don't really, yeah. Like, yeah, right. I mean, one of one of the and great... I, and I'm not, like, always sexually accessible. I mean, I don't know if that's a... I, that's, I don't know if that's a... Yeah. A characteristic ace. of ace. I think that's just... A characteristic selectiveness. of selectiveness. I think so. I mean, I can be selective, and then there's times where you know I'm not. You know, like in Costa Rica. But <laughs> that was a selection. That was selective. There's like we selected. <laughs> we did. We did. There's actually a great book that I'd love to recommend to 
to folks. Um, it's called Ace. It's by Angela Chen. Um, highly recommend it. Y'all should pick it up too. Mm-hmm. It's not just a book for people who are on the Ace spectrum. It's literally a really great book that interrogates our sex obsessed and also sex negative culture that we mm. live in and the ways that these messages that are put upon us about like you need to be sexy and you need to be sexual and this is the type of sex you need to have and blah 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 like it really just goes deep into like that's not that's not the reality for everyone and like why are we putting this presumption onto people that they should be sexual when they don't have to be if they don't want to be you know so I recommend that book yeah no I think there's so many women I'm sure listening right now that are like oh shit this sounds like me Mm -hmm. you know and like and there there is so much shame attached to you know not wanting to have sex like what's wrong with your libido like are you are you your your diet's fucked up you're not Mm -hmm. eating enough you're not doing this you're not doing that like you're not masturbating enough you're not you know there's all these different things that Society puts, especially on women, of course. Um, I think men too experience this as well too. Oh yeah. And and honestly, it must be even. It might almost be harder for men because men are like supposed to be like, come get it, come take it, mm-hmm. like yeah. the, like the aggressor in the bedroom. And and I mean, I, I'm guilty of it. I dated someone who was not very sexual, and I literally was like, well, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. I literally was like, why are you 44 and you're not trying to fuck me? Like it didn't. It didn't like it didn't add up in my mind, but even having this conversation, it's really making me like to be mindful of like your actual wants is definitely a process. You know what I mean? Like, what are my actual wants versus am I doing? Am I is it performative? Like, am I showing up and wanting to have sex because it gives me validation? You know, if you have sex with me, then I feel validated in our relationship that you're attracted to me and that our relationship mm-hmm. is going well. But like, even for me, like. I know I have a lot of confused thoughts of sex. We talk about this shit all the time. Like, am I having sex because I'm empowered or am I having sex because I'm traumatized and, and filling a void? You know, it's a constant, like, I'm having to check in with myself. But the truth is, is that I've been clouded with so many ideas and thoughts and beliefs that it is going to take a very long time to get to the bottom of that. Yeah. Like, even the other day I was having sex with, like, my fuck buddy and... um I thought he was going to leave after he had sex and he didn't. He like laid in the bed and fell asleep. And I was like, (laughs) so confused. And then I was like, is something wrong with me? Like, why am I such a cold bitch? I'm like, he could lay there, but he was snoring. It was irritating me. And I was like, oh, but also I was having all, I was high, but I was like having all these thoughts. Like, am I having like, do I need to have a like deeper connection to this man? No, he's nice. Sex is good. I was literally laying in the bed while he was snoring. I was pissed because I couldn't go to sleep. But then I was like literally digging deep into my feelings over me having sex. Like it was good. Sex was good. Did I have to do that? Could I have just taken my ass to sleep? Could have. But you didn't. Like I was really weighing back and forth. But this has been my experience in my sexuality for a long time. Like even in college, being in my super ho, ho phase, just fucking. I knew that something was wrong. I was like, mm. there was a time I was like, bitch, why are you doing this? Like, and I'm like, and I asked my aunt, like, do you think I should get hypnotized? You think I'm like, I think I have some trauma I need to work through. But I, but it's, it's, it's been a constant inner conversation about whether or not I'm having sex genuinely because I want to, or, you know what I mean? It's just such a clouded voice because obviously like my body at some point enjoy, enjoys it and you climax for the, you I hope but like also is it like a feel like an autopilot feeling of like oh this plus this equals good you know what I mean mm-hmm. but like is it something I actually need to have or do I probably could probably pleasure myself and then be good yeah coming coming to those realizations of like do I actually want to do this or is this something that I've been told I should do? And is this something that I actually like or is this something that I've been told I should like? Like that just like can blow your mind. It's This is making me think of a story um, of a client that I worked with recently. We worked with each other um, a few years ago and then we worked with each other again this most recent time this year. And the first time we worked together, um, she came to me and was like, I'm in my mid twenties. I am not having sex. I don't desire sex, but I want to, because when I was in college, I was fucking all the time. I was having one night stands. I was having a gay old time. It was so much fun. So I want to get back to her. And so 
you know, the work that we did together was just exploring like what was going on for you during that time. And perhaps you're a little bit more confident in your body and, you know, you're younger, so you didn't maybe have as many responsibilities. So we were just exploring, exploring that. And then fast forward to like maybe five years later, we worked together again. um, And she came, came back with the same thing. Like I... I'm not having sex. Um, I don't know how. I just sort of fell off from, you know, the work that we did. I want to get that part of me back. And um, long story short, we realized that she was actually asexual. And this version of herself that she was trying to get back to was a farce. It was an illusion. She wasn't having sex with these people because she wanted to. She wasn't having sex with these people because her body had a desire to have sex with these people. She was having sex because that's what society told her to do. That's what her culture in college told her to do. And also because um, for her, it wasn't about the pleasure or the physicality of sex. It was like, if you fuck me, you love me. If you fuck me, it means that I am worthy. If you fuck me, you're validating me Mm. and making me feel like I am seen and heard and safe and loved. And it was it was quite an interesting experience to watch her get to that point because again she was really wanting to get back to that that person that version of her, but it wasn't even a real version. And it took her actually sitting with herself and asking herself these questions. Wait, do I want to have sex? Do I like having sex? Is this something that I want? And the answers to to those questions were like, it varied. It depended on the time. It depended on the person. It, like there were so many different things. So I encourage everyone to do that deep work of figuring out like, is this desire or is this a should that is being put upon me? Mm. And that's where that body literacy really can come in with sensuality. Like you, your body will know or your body will tell you what it feels like um, to like sort of have that enthusiastic yes you know it almost sounds like she was much it was she was way more able in her youth to disassociate from herself and that Mm -hmm. she had done the work actually and she should be proud that now her body is like bitch we can't fake it no more sorry that's that's what i told her i was like listen your body is just like okay we're done we can't yeah we can't do this we've you did you you met with evian and we did the work (laughs) sorry girl we're not horny anymore (laughs) It's not happening. We don't want, we don't want them. We're yeah. good. Yeah. And for her, you know, it's not like I don't want to have sex ever, but she has redefined what sex means for her. And she's redefined what sex means for her on the terms of like, what does my body want? And typically for her, sex isn't about like penetration. It's like, I want you to, you know, make out with me naked or something like that. Like that to me is enough stimulation and it feels really good for me, you know? And thankfully she's with a partner that is taking that ride with her and being like, cool, let's explore different ways to have sex, you know? And again, that's why it's, it's so important that if you're on the sexual liberation journey, you're choosing partners that are able to go with you on that journey and not shame you for whatever you're going through. I was, I, I'm sure you've probably watched this, um, sex love goop. Have you watched it? I haven't. I've heard of it. Yeah, it was really it was really interesting. There was this um, couple that came on. It was actually a black married couple, and they're happy. They have this great life, but he is super like gung ho. Like he he wants to fuck, and she is. He said like she's a prude, and like she's mm. not really like. I hate just, that word. Isn't, yeah, she's a prude, and, and for lack of a better word, and more less experienced than him, and. Through the work with, um, through the work with one of these, her name was actually what's her name? Shit, what's her name? Do you remember? You said it like five. I times. know. How the fuck do I know her Jaya? name? No. Jaya. 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 So, um, she they discovered that actually that well their sex languages are different. Like mm. he is one of those like he's stimulated by just like titties and ass. Like those are the things <laughs> that like get him going. Makes sense. Whereas mm-hmm. for Men. whereas for her, she's way more into like the anticipation of touch. And like mm-hmm. the buildup and like, and what, what, what they found was that actually she's a lot more sexually advanced than him mm-hmm. in her, because she's really into the foreplay. She wants to experiment with different things before just having penetrative sex. And I think a lot of times, um, that part of sex is overlooked. We're supposed to just like, oh, I'm wet. This means we must have sex. Like Insert here. Yeah, like mm-hmm. a guy sees his dick is hard. Oh, I must be horny. Oh, my pussy's wet. Oh, I guess I should have sex now. Mm-hmm. And there's no lead up. There's no anticipation. I know for me, like that's 
something that is important to me. Like I'm, I need a lead up. I can do both. But when, when I have the best sex of my life, it usually involves a lot of foreplay. And like, I need the lead up. I need like kissing. I need sensuality. And sometimes I don't even have to have the sex. I usually will. But, (laughs) but, but it's, but I just think that it's so true that finding the right partner. And also like, if you do have a partner that you love and everything else is good with that part, that piece is missing, exploring what that means, meeting, meeting with someone that can kind of help guide you. When I saw that, when I watched that show, I was like, how many relationships have ended because they didn't know that something like this existed right. that they or they were embarrassed to ask they were embarrassed to talk about it and just knowing that like some I th- thankfully for social media and I guess Netflix and Gwen- <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow I guess I don't know um, <laughs> oh, Gwyneth. Um, that like these type of these type of things can be resolved and sometimes they can't yeah. and, and that's okay too you yeah know? yeah I think that's one of the beauties of the this era that we're in, you know, like we're seeing a lot more conversations about sex and we're really normalizing the issues that come up with sex. I think for a while it was like, everyone's having the best sex except for me. I'm the one that has the problems. And it's like, no, all of us are sort of fumbling around and trying to find our way. And that's very normal. You know, it's okay for us to still not really know what we're doing and um, in, in this case with this guy who is just like penetration, ass, tits, let's go. I mean, it makes a lot of sense because that's the culture we live in. We live in a very pornographic male gazy world. And I think a lot of us have grown up thinking that the way to have liberated sex is to fuck like a man, you know, to mm. fuck like a man where it's like you see something visual, you get immediately wet or hard and you just like go for th- and that's not that's not the case. That's one aspect and one way to to be in your sexuality but that's not that's not the case for everyone you know yeah for sure I'm so glad that you came and like broke this down for us I think this is going to resonate with a lot of women it definitely resonates with me I definitely have to like have deeper talks with myself get more in tune with my body I know I always see you online doing your sensual dancing I'd like to sensual dance in the mirror too but there is something deeply sexy and like intimate about gazing at yourself in an intimate space without anyone else being there to validate you you know just like damn I'm damn I look good today damn this feels sexy on my body damn this like just moving feels good like just being in your body like you said like we just came back from Costa Rica and we did like a um a self devotion like self worship like this sensual circle with the with the girls and it was so fun and beautiful and like you know we just danced in a circle and like gave thanks to the elements and to our ancestors and it just like reminded me how much as women like the divine feminine is sensual it's a part of our identity and Mm. like it's been such for so long like under the gaze of men under the standards of men that we forget that like it's our like our our birthright and like a part of our our experience to explore that even without being sexual or having intercourse in it that's right that's right Yeah. Can I plug something? Yeah, of course. So we're talking about sensuality here and I should have brought you both copies of my book, but I have a book. It's called Sensual Self and it is a guided journal that helps you with practices and exercises and prompts to basically do just that, like connect with your body, figure out the messages that your body is sending you, figuring out like what does pleasure feel like in my body, Um, really starting to create some boundaries and also some curiosity about Yeah, the things that your body needs in order to feel safe and um, have an enthusiastic yes experience. So um, I wrote this book because I hear stories like this so often, like, okay, I know I need to connect to my body. I don't really know what what the voice of desire in my body feels like because I've been overriding it for so long. And, you know, there's all these different cultural voices and messages that are telling me what I should want. But what do I want um, yeah, that's why I wrote my book, Sensual Self. I need that book. I need that book. And, yeah. and you know, also it, it just like, it dawned on me, like during this conversation, when you're talking about, you know, this voice telling you, you needed to move. And like, this is when you honoring that. Um, I just think that just sitting with yourself and being with your body oftentimes will clear 
all of the uh, like your intuition will be much yes. sharper because you've sat in your body and you're not trying to add other people and other shit into it. You're really just being mindful a of how you feel in your body. That's right. And that's like even outside of sex, you know, and then and then when you do get clear messages from spirit, you're like, oh, I can move on that because mm-hmm. I've, been, I've, 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 I'm conscious that this is what, these are the voices that I need to listen to. Mm-hmm. And I think so often, like as women, we, that we let that part of us like fall at the wayside because we're constantly being told how we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be. And then our voice, our inner voice, the voices of our ancestors, the ones we're supposed to listen to kind of like go mute. Yeah. So it's like being mindful, you know, like in your body really is a segue to just be mindful in your life in general. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's so much, it, it's so much deeper than just sex. Mm-hmm. Like, like you said, for sure. Yeah. Hmm. Well, is there any, I'm, I'm really glad you came finally after we stalked you for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for um, having me. <laughs> is there any, um, is there anything else that you want to tell our listeners where they can find you? Yeah, um, I have a podcast as well. It's called Sensual Self. Um, It is also the title of my book, Sensual Self, which you can find anywhere that you get books. Um, You can also find me on Instagram. That's where I'm like the most visible these days. And uh, yeah, join my newsletter, evianwhitney.com slash newsletter. Trying to get people over there. Yeah, I feel <laughs> you. Get off the IGs. Yes, it's so hard. It's so hard over there. Um, before we started, actually, I forgot, Evian... Um, pulled a card and the card was the world card. So I'm just going to read to you guys what that means a little bit. Let's see if it pertains to our conversation. It usually does because we're witches. (laughs) Um, When the world card appears in a tarot reading, you're glowing with a sense of wholeness, achievement, fulfillment, and completion. Mm-hmm. A long-term project, period of study, relationship, or career has come full circle, and you are now reveling in the sense of closure and accomplishment. This card could represent graduation, a marriage, the birth of a child, or achieving a long-held dream or aspiration. You have finally accomplished your goal or purpose. Everything has come together, and you are in the right place, doing the right thing, achieving what you have envisioned. You feel whole and complete. Mm-hmm. A beautiful card. I love the world. Mm. very happy to pick that one today it invites you to reflect on your journey honor your achievements and tune into your spiritual lessons celebrate your success and bask in the joy of having brought your goals to fruition wow well thank you for giving <laughs> me an impromptu reading oh well, you're welcome i just went on biddy <laughs> <laughs> it's not you know i'm working on my tarot skills um before we close out i know you mentioned that you may have a hori for us yeah, it's kind of short. Um, so I have a puppy and I got a puppy two months ago and she has been a delight and a terror. And so much of my life has been taken up by her. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, me and my partner haven't been having sex because it's really difficult to have sex when you have a puppy. We're trying to crate train her, but you know, that's a long, oh, so, long it's process. Torturous. Oh my God. You know, you have, I mean, well, I have a baby, which is okay. basically like crate training <laughs> is like basically like night training with babies. Not night training. It is. And they're screaming in the you room. You cannot compare you, your child to a of puppy. Of course I can. People are going to come for you. It's so awful. Like one time we were trying to have sex and um, the puppy sleeps with us in our bed and, you know, we're like being really quiet. And then, like, all of a sudden, we start getting really into it, but we're still really quiet. And she just comes over up to us and starts licking our faces. And we're like, this is not. And then I did a Google, and I was like, why did my dog <laughs> not a Google. come up to me for, you know, after we were, or while we were having sex? And apparently, dogs can, like, smell your hormones and stuff. Mm. So she smelled that we were getting excited. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is not going to work. So, um yeah, me and my partner, we've just been like, fuck, how are we going to ha- ever have sex again? Because she's, I think she's no longer a puppy by the time she's like a year and a half. So we've got a long way to go. And um, yeah, last night we're like, fuck it. We're having sex right now. <laughs> we just like put her crate in the bedroom and then like gave her this like fish hide situation. And she was like chewing and smacking on this bone while we were like getting it in. And it was great. I loved every second of it. We both like had an orgasm way too fast because it had been way too long. But it was so great. I was so stoned. And <laughs> it was amazing. This sounds like parenthood. This yeah. sounds like how I have to, I have had to have sex with my daughters in the house. Fuck. So. It's so hard. I have so much respect for parents because I, I, I will not have babies in my lifetime. I've decided that. Um, and my God, my dog is giving me a lot of energy well the good thing the only you know the good thing about having a dog is that you can legally put them in a cage you can legally (laughs) put them in a cage 
True. <laughs> with a fish hide. <laughs> if I put Irie in a cage in her room with, with like a, a with an iPad, Goldfish. don't come out. <laughs> Shut up. Mom has some shit to do. <laughs> Wouldn't blow over so so easily. No. Oh my god. Well, thank you so much for coming on the yeah, show. Thank this you was for such a treat. Me. Um, you guys know where to find us. Good moms, bad choices. Um, on Instagram. Well, good moms underscore bad choices on Instagram. Make sure you check out our Patreon. We have tons of bonus content over there. We have some horror stories that we've um, updated recently that you definitely don't want to miss out on. Me and Mila had a shared group horror story together. Um, that's no. what? When you say group? Well, it's me and you. We're okay, the group. Right, we're the group. We're the group. Plus one. <laughs> yeah, three. You know? Like Destiny's Child, like after everyone left. Um, <laughs> good Moms Bad... Wait, actually, it's patreon.com backslash Good Moms Bad Choices. I'll link everything in our episode description. Make sure you check out our merch. We've dropped some really cute shit over the last few months, and it's real, real cute. Hopefully, it's still there. I don't know. By the time you listen to this, and it might all be gone. Um, but anyway, I love you, and have a good week. Bye. Bye.